Okay, good morning everyone. It's, it's great to be here and have an opportunity to talk to you all about uh, what I do on a daily basis and what we see in the global economy. Um, is anyone here, has anyone taken Dr. Varamini's international finance course before? <laughs> Ashley, <laughs> okay. Um, this, if you have, this is probably a review because I, I sometimes do a similar presentation uh, in his course. Um, out of the group here, how many IB students are there? Okay, so it looks like we have a nice crowd from the IB group. Okay, so you, you might have seen me before um, through some of the International Business Day. So I'm always very excited to participate uh, with E-Town's IB uh, students and get to know them and, and participate in some of the courses. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, how we can provide services to clients who are importing and exporting. And uh, even though you might think, well, I'm not really interested in global business, I want to work more in domestic business, eventually all domestic business touches global business in some capacity. So we find a lot of clients uh, in our customer base who never had any intention of doing international trade who suddenly find uh, customers overseas, customers who find them via their websites. They may need to diversify their supply chain and they're now finding that their U.S. supplier is no longer making the highest quality product and they need, they need to look overseas for that. So, so a lot of businesses unintentionally become international businesses and they don't have a lot of background in dealing with some of the risks in, in international trade. And that's where we come in, where we can sit down with the client and help to offer our services to, to manage the risk in those transactions. Okay, so starting with that, um, my department is called the Fulton International Group. And again, our mission is to facilitate international payments and receipts. Uh, we do both corporate and, and individual, though the bulk of our income stream does come from our, our corporate customer base. So basically, we're here to reduce the risk in, in executing an import or export transactions. And we pr do provide a lot of education. So I do a lot of seminars like this for our customer and prospect base to help, them ed to help educate them on what the risks are, whether it's a currency risk, they're executing their transaction in euro or British pound or Australian dollar, or whether it's a credit risk. If they have a foreign customer, they have no idea who that customer is. Can they pay them on time? If they make a shipment to them, what's going to happen in the follow-up? So there, there are a lot of additional risks that they would face when they move to, to import-export uh, that they may not have on the domestic side. Okay, so I'll just start with, in, in order to build uh, international services, there are a lot of tools and infrastructure that need to be in place. Um, so a lot of banks, a lot of smaller banks may not have international departments because it does require a whole new set of, of platforms, uh, relationships with foreign banks throughout the world. Uh, it requires obviously the staff who has the knowledge, spe specialized knowledge to manage that. And a uh, very, very specialized piece of it <clears throat> is foreign exchange trading, trading currency with banks all over the world and being able to manage that payment flow into different countries and deal with all of their different formatting and regulation issues. So, so not every bank has international. Um, and it's it's going to depend typically on the bank size and what their background is and what their customer base is if they are able to, to build out that department and, and serve that clientele. Okay, in our department, uh, this is our list of products and services. So we, so we call retail what we would offer through our branch network. So if, if anyone just walked into a Fulton Bank branch and said, oh, my, my grandma lives in the Czech Republic and I, I want to send her 200,000 Czech krona. So we can do a, a wire transfer for that, like that for her, but it will come into our department and we're going to support uh, the sale of that check corona as well as transferring the funds and that's that's what we would designate as a, a retail transaction so we would do wires and drafts which is like a, a check drawn on a foreign bank as well as paper currency for travelers but again the bulk of our income is going to come from the corporate side and that's where we could offer uh, import export letters of credit so we'll talk a little bit more in detail about what all these products mean um, documentary collections, financing trade through, through export financing, uh, those foreign exchange wires, whether that 
a U.S. dollar wire going to an international bank or a foreign currency wire, and the hedging products where we're going to help them to mitigate the risk of fluctuating currency markets. So this is our list of services that we would go out and, and meet with a customer and present to them. And then we would look at their business model, at their flow of transactions, and explain to them how we could apply our services to their business. Okay, we'll start with documentary transactions. Who knows what a letter of credit is? A couple of people? Okay. Okay talk a little bit more in detail about a, about a letter of credit. So basically, let's start looking from the exporter side. If you are an exporter, you're a US company who has suddenly found a foreign company who's going to buy your goods. So you need to ship those goods to them, and it'll typically be on an ocean shipment. You need to think about uh, customs, about all the logistics of getting the shipment there, and then you need to think about how am I going to bill them? Am I going to send them a US dollar invoice? Am I going to send them a Euro invoice, a Swiss franc invoice? And then you need to think about, when am I going to get paid for that shipment? Are they able to pay me in advance? Um, do they need some credit from me? Can I send them the shipment and then wait to get paid? Can I trust them? So a lot, a lot of questions will be going through the company's mind. So the most favorable is going to be cash in advance to say, like, I don't want to take any risk. I just want you to pay me ahead of time, and then I'm going to ship my goods to you. So this is great to say that, but it's sometimes very difficult for a company to be able to get cash in advance. So that's a pretty tight uh, requirement for a new customer to be able to pay cash in advance. So they may not have the funds available to pay immediately. So we have to look at the next one down. Can we offer a letter of credit? <coughs> Okay, so a letter of credit means that the buyer, the importer in this case, is going to go to their bank in the foreign country and say, I need a letter of credit, which means they're going to use their credit that they keep with that bank, and they're going to actually send a financial instrument, a letter of credit, to the U.S. bank. So if it's our customer, that, ba that letter of credit is going to come in to us, and now we have a guarantee from the foreign bank that they're going to pay us. So basically, in a letter of credit, you're moving the risk from the foreign customer to the foreign bank. So if we have uh, our customer, our customer here in Pennsylvania has a new customer in Australia. And so they're, they're like, well, this company looks great. I'm very excited to make this export sale. I'm concerned about them. I don't know who they are. I don't know if they're going to pay me on time. I don't know if they have proper credit to be able to do that. So now we suddenly we get a letter of credit from their bank, which is, let's pick ANZ Bank, which is a very large and, and reputable bank in Australia. So we get a letter of credit now from ANZ Bank saying, we're going to pay you uh, for this shipment. And then we're going to provide you with all, you're going to provide us, I'm sorry, with all the documentation on the shipment. We'll check it against the letter of credit, and then we're going to pay you. So now we've moved the credit risk from XYZ Company in Australia to ANZ Bank, uh, who we know very well, and we feel very comfortable with their credit. So this is a, a secure transaction for a bank. This now becomes a bank to bank transaction instead of a corporate to corporate transaction. So you can see under letter of credit, we have confirmed or unconfirmed. Confirmed letter of credit means that the US bank is going to offer their guarantee as well. So if our customer says, OK, well, that's great. We have a letter of credit from ANZ Bank. But I don't know that bank. You might know that bank, but I don't know them. And I'm uncomfortable with that risk. Could you, Fulton Bank, add your guarantee? And we can add our guarantee as well if we're comfortable with ANZ Bank in Australia. Um, so we could add our confirmation to that. So we can have confirmed or unconfirmed. And every time you take risk away from a transaction, it costs money. <laughs> okay, So this is how banks are making money in the transaction. If we issue a letter of credit on behalf of our buyer who's, a, who's an importer, if our customer is an importer, we're going to charge them for that letter of credit. If we take in a letter of credit and process the payment receiving it from the foreign bank for our customer who's the exporter, we're going to charge them. If we confirm the letter of credit and we take the risk from the foreign bank and move it to ourselves, we're going to charge them. So this is how banks make money, by executing transactions as well as taking on risk 
for other foreign banks. Okay, so the next one down would be to buy export credit insurance. So our customer might say, I don't want to do a letter of credit, too messy, you know, too much paperwork involved. I'll just go out and get an insurance policy on my receivable. So now you have to pay a premium to insure that foreign receivable that our customer is now getting from, from their new Australian customer. And they can do that through a government entity like SBA or Exim Bank, um, which is a, a federal bank that supports U.S. exports. Or they could look to a private insurance company who provided export credit insurance. Okay, the next one down the chain, so we're looking uh, more favorable to least favorable. So at the, the further we go down the chain, the riskier the transaction becomes for our customer. This one is called a documentary collection, and it's sort of like a letter of credit. It's a bank-to-bank -bank transaction, but there is no guarantee to pay. So in this case, the foreign bank um, will exchange documents with us uh, about the shipment but there won't be any guarantee from them in place. So, so we're still, the customer has no guarantee that they're getting paid, but they know that the banks are handling the transaction between them. And the last one is called open account. So this is when you just put your goods on the ship and you send it off to Australia and you hope that they pay you in 30 days or how ma however many uh, days you've given them as payment terms on the invoice. So open account can work very well uh, if you know your customer. So it all depends on how, how well uh, the relationship has been established between the importer and the exporter. So a lot of times we'll see clients with a new relationship if they have a new customer overseas, they'll start with cash in advance and they'll move down the chain as they become more comfortable if they've been selling to the same company in Australia for three years, everything's going very smoothly, they feel like they have a good level of trust with them, they might move down the chain and, and end up at open account where they'll just ship them the goods and send them an invoice and, and wait to get paid later. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit more about the components of, of a letter of credit. It's just called a commercial letter of credit or a documentary letter of credit. So again, it is a bank-to-bank -bank transaction, removing credit concerns from the company to the foreign bank or the U.S. bank. So if, it, if our customer is the importer, we will issue the letter of credit. If our customer is the exporter, we will receive the letter of credit from the foreign bank. And it is a guarantee of payment by a bank for an international shipment based on the presentation of correct shipping documents. So within the letter of credit, it'll give the bank a list of documents that have to be supplied. It'll look something like invoice, bill of lading, packing list. Sometimes it might require an inspection certificate, but it will list up all the documents. And all the documents that are listed have to be provided by the exporter's bank and sent to the importer's bank and then checked against that letter of credit. Does everything sync up? It looks like all the shipping documents are in line, so the banks are, are comfortable in executing the transactions. A letter of credit is governed by the International Chamber of Commerce, and uh, not that you have to memorize that, it's called the UCC 600. Um, if you ever have insomnia, it can be a very good tool <laughs> to, to put you out. <laughs> um, but it is, a, it's probably like a, uh, 50 or 60 page uh, document that defines all the rules and regulations in dealing with letters of credit. So any bank in the world who does letters of credit will need to comply with those regulations. Okay, again, the purpose of the letter of credit is to guarantee the sh payment of, of shipment. So it, you're looking at the bank's str strength versus the customer's credit. So let's say that our customer um, is making uh, a transaction with a company in Nigeria, which is a very, very risky area. So if our customer is the, the exporter and we've now received a letter of credit from a Nigerian bank, we're going to be very nervous. We're going to say we are, are very uh, leery of trusting this letter of credit. This bank, we don't know anything about them. They could go down in flames and we could be left holding the bag. Um, so we're going to look for 
another bank to help us out, another bank who might know that bank who could help to guarantee that letter of credit. So that's the way that, that international banks will work together. They'll supply guarantees, they'll supply credit to each other in support of transactions. So we may not know that bank. That bank may end up being fine, but we don't know them, so we have to find another bank that we do know who knows them and can offer a guarantee on their behalf. So the letter of credit also requires compliance with the shipping terms and conditions. Within the letter of credit, they can say, you have to make your shipment by March 31st. You have to make your shipment from the Port of Baltimore. They can define all the parameters of the shipment itself. Um, it, it allows for secure handling of the bill of lading. And the bill of lading is actually the title document to the goods. Once the goods are loaded on a ship, it, the uh, shipping company produces original bill of lading, which is the actual title to those goods, and that gets passed through the banks uh, to the final importer. Um, a letter of credit can allow for financing abilities, and it is, of course, the actual payment mechanism of the shipment. So in order for the exporter to get paid, they do have to present all of the documents through the bank goes to, the, to uh, the importer's bank, they review it, they pay it, and they receive uh, their payment for those goods. Okay, so this is just a, a diagram showing how that risk can be transferred. So you have the risk of the foreign buyer, and then you move that risk to the foreign bank as they issue the letter of credit, and then it comes to the local bank, um, and again, we call a correspondent bank. In, in, in the world of banking, when banks trade services with each other, we call that correspondent banking. So again, in, this, in the example of Fulton Bank receives a, a letter of credit from a bank in Nigeria that we're very nervous about, we're going to go to one of our correspondent banks, probably out of New York, maybe like a JP Morgan, uh, a larger bank like that. We're going to say, hey, what do you know about this Nigerian bank? Do you have a relationship with them? can you give us a guarantee on that letter of credit? So we would reach out to one of our correspondents to help us in that transaction. Okay, this, this is a confusing slide and uh, I'm gonna just kind of pass over it. There are a lot of steps that take place in the transaction. So this whole presentation that I'm doing, I think last time I did this for Dr. Varamini's class, we, we looked at examples and went through everything and it took us uh, about 90 minutes. So I'm gonna be passing through um, a few of the more complex slides so, so we can finish on time and hopefully take some questions. Okay, so again, the key components in a letter of credit, it's going to give you a merchandise description. It's going to say like 50 metric tons of widgets or whatever, whatever your product is will be listed out specifically in the letter of credit. It'll say the shipping terms, when it has to ship from the, uh, the export port as well as the import port. Uh, it's going to list the expiration date of the letter of credit, the currency and amount. So you could have a letter of credit in any, in any currency. We could issue a letter of credit in Japanese yen, in Swiss franc, in British pound, as well as we could receive one in, in another currency. And it's also going to list out the fee structure. Who pays what fees? So there are two banks involved. So is the importer just going to pay their bank's fees and the exporter pay their bank's fees, or are they going to push all of the fees to one side or the other. That will all be determined within the letter of credit. Okay, I th we'll pass through this one too. It just talks about the different entities that are involved in the letter of credit. Okay, so again, as an exporter, why are you gonna offer payment terms? Why are you gonna allow them to maybe pay you later or or use a letter of credit or one of those other instruments. So we, we want to be increasing sales. For our customers, they want to export, they want to grow their target market, and they need to do that by being customer friendly. So always demanding cash in advance is not always the most customer friendly way to do business uh, because you, you could really uh, reduce your growth in your, in your export customer base because a lot of clients may say, yeah, I'm not going to buy that from you when this other company is going to offer me 60-day payment terms. Why should I pay you cash in advance if I could get the same product uh, with better terms somewhere else? So we have to remain very competitive. Um, if we remain competitive and give them 60 or 90 day payment terms, whatever we can offer, can we increase our margin a little bit? 
Uh, can we diversify our export market? Can we build some strategic partnerships with companies in other countries who could introduce us to other new customers? So, so there are a lot of reasons to offer payment terms and not just demand uh, cash in advance. Okay, um, this one too, I won't go into a whole lot of detail except to say that SBA and Exim Bank are both government entities. Um, the, US, the US government as well as the Pennsylvania state government are very focused on increasing exports. So of course the more exports uh, we have, the more jobs theoretically that we're creating. And so there, there are a lot of tools out there for companies who do export, there are a lot of uh, uh, marketing assistance through the state of Pennsylvania for, for marketing their products overseas and there are a lot of financing opportunities. So sometimes a company may not be able to get enough credit from their bank uh, to be able to support building whatever product they are, they're building to make that export sale. And in that case, they're gonna go to someone like the SBA or the Exim Bank in Washington, D.C. and look for some help in getting credit. And so there, there are a lot more tools available to them by going through one of these government agencies um, if they can prove that they're actually making an export. So we, a lot of times we help to set up our customers uh, with these government entities if we're not able to just give them uh, credit or, or enough of uh, cash, in ad cash advance that they can use to build their product. We may not be able to do that based on their financials, but if we can get a guarantee from a government entity, then we're willing to do that. So it's so another one of our partners. Okay, again, I'll, <clears throat> I won't go through it, this in detail, and I guess, will, will everyone have access to mm -hmm. the presentation later? Okay, so you could read through this. Just talks about the different uh, ways that we could make that import-export and, and the risks involved to either the import or the export side. Okay, I'm gonna move on to foreign exchange risk. Okay. <clears throat> so the foreign exchange market uh, really affects everyone. Um, so even though we, although a letter of credit, for example, can be issued in any currency, we typically see probably 90% of letters of credit issued in U.S. dollars. Um, but, but foreign currency is certainly available to, to use in any transaction. And I have a lot of customers who will come to me and say, that's too complex. I don't want to worry about all that extra work in, in making the currency conversion, in thinking about the risk in currency markets. I just want to deal in dollars. But the problem with saying that is your foreign customer or your foreign supplier is not dealing in dollars. Okay, so they're dealing with the risk now. They're dealing with the currency risk as far as making a sale to our customer or else buying goods from our customer. And is that currency risk going to affect them to the point where they can't do business with us? You know, how, how is that affecting the whole transaction? So we want to be, from a customer standpoint, we, we want to be very customer friendly if we're exporting and we want to also be aware of what our suppliers are dealing with in order to provide us with the product we need. So. So it's important for all companies to be aware of the risk in the market and who is going to mitigate that risk and who will, will ultimately benefit or, or suffer from that risk. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background in, in uh, foreign exchange, it is the largest financial market in the world. So any, any type of financial transaction, whether it's cash, equity, bond, anything, finally comes down to a settlement at the end. And is that settlement going to take place in dollars? Is it going to play, take place in dollar euro, dollar pound, dollar Swiss franc, Swiss franc yen? So there are a lot of different variations of that final settlement. And so that's, that's what drives the currency market. Um, it's very speculative. Probably 80% of trading that happens in the currency markets uh, is, is speculative and not just based on, on like what we're doing, buying and selling currency to support an import or export. We have two to four trillion dollars traded a day. Um, London is actually the largest foreign exchange market in the world, so it's really centered in, in London, New York, and Tokyo. Um, and it is supply and demand. Currencies are traded 24 hours a day. So exchange rates change very quickly. We have a lot of currency screens in our department where we're watching the, the movement 
of currency and it really does uh, every few seconds that price is flipping up and down and so when we're selling that to customers or buying that in the market uh, we have to be very aware of how quickly that price can change. Um, so within, within the world of currencies, we have clean float versus dirty float. So currencies that, were, that are very well known that we, we all uh, hear about, dollar, euro, pound, Swiss franc, Canadian dollar, those are all what we call clean float. So the price is driven by supply and demand. Every day as that currency is traded, the price is moving up or down. We also have currencies in the world which are on what we call a dirty float. So dirty float means that the government has a hand in that price. So China, China is moving more towards a clean float, but it's still on somewhat of a dirty float in that the government does not allow it to move past a certain point. Um, you have other currencies uh, throughout Southeast Asia. A lot of the Latin American currencies are on dirty floats. So countries that have a less developed economy are typically on a dirty float. The, uh, most of the industrialized nations are on a clean float where you could buy and sell the currency freely in the market. Okay, these, and these are not um, current exchange rates, but just to show you the difference in, in how we could show prices. So you see the, the uh, rates in yellow and the rates in white are either American style or European style. So all the currencies on the left we always see quoted in white, which is American style. So that's how many, how many dollars per foreign unit. So the first one, Euro, US dollar, we can say that it's a dollar 35. And that's actually very close to today's price, <laughs> but it's a dollar 35 for one Euro. Uh, the currencies on the right side, the US CAD, which is Canadian, US with Swiss, Swiss franc, US Japanese yen, US Chinese yuan. Those are always quoted uh, on the other side, in the, on the top one, which is European style. So how many foreign units per US dollar? So basically, to get the US equivalent for the currencies on the left side, we would have to multiply the exchange rate times the US dollar amount. And on the right side, we would divide. And that's, that sounds like just a simple little difference, but it can be very confusing trading currency in the market. And customers will call in, they say, I need to buy 50,000 Canadian dollars to pay an invoice. We give them a price and they're confused because they're multiplying and not dividing. So it's important for them to know which side of the market, or is it a divide or a multiply currency? So the, the currency markets can be a little bit confusing, but they're always quoted in that market convention, so depending on, on the country. Okay, in the currency market, we have what's called spot market, which is the current market. So if you look at the Wall Street Journal, or you look at Bloomberg, or Yahoo Finance, or at any one of those, news agencies which are quoting exchange rates, you're seeing spot rates. And uh, a, spot, a spot deal will typically settle in two days. So it means if we go to the market and uh, we have banks in New York that we trade currency with, so we, we buy a million euro, that million euro is going to settle somewhere and it's gonna settle into our euro account, which we hold in, in Germany. And it'll settle in two days. So today's Friday. If we buy that million today, it's going to settle into our account on Tuesday. If we buy a million Canadian dollars, it's going to settle into our account on Monday. So, so that's called a spot value. And these value dates are in place to support different time zones and actually moving the funds um, throughout the world to, to other, other countries. Um, so currency is, is always held in the country of its origin, and that's an important key to remember in foreign exchange market. So if we hold a euro account, that euro is actually sitting in an account in the European Union. We have a British pound account out of London. We have a Canadian dollar account out of Toronto and, and so on. So those accounts will always have to be held in that country. And, the, and when funds move, they're always settled into that account that's sitting in, in the country of that currency. Um, so within the currency market, when you look at, for example, the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg, you might only see one rate, and that's what we call the mid-market rate, but there is a buy and a sell rate. So just like in any type of financial instrument, like if you think of interest rates, there's a loan rate and there's a deposit rate, and they're not the same. But the middle of that is, is going to be the mid-mark. So that's what we do in the currency markets. We might see one price, but when they're actually 
being bought or sold, they're going to be a little bit different. So if we see a euro rate at 132, if we customer wants to buy that, they're probably going to pay 132.50. If they're going to sell it, it's going to go backwards 131.50. So there will be a difference between that buy and the sell market. Um, the interbank market. The, so the interbank market is made up of very large banks who actually set the prices in currencies. This is like the, the Citibank and the Bank of America and the Deutsche Banks of the world who are trading you know, $100 million worth of currency in, in one uh, transaction. So the interbank market becomes very tight. So that difference between the buy and the sell spread, or we call bid and ask, becomes very, very narrow. And then if we're selling out in the corporate level, that the spread between that bid and the ask, the buy and the sell becomes much wider. So we can see pr how prices go through the market. If you get down to the level where you're buying like cash, like I need to buy 200 <coughs> euro for, to support my trip to France, that's going to be a very wide spread between the buy and the sell. And that's something that we have to educate customers about because they may say, well, why are you quoting me this price on euro when I'm looking in the Wall Street Journal right now and I'm seeing this price? So they have to understand that it's, there, we can't just give that mid-market price. There's always going to be a buy and a sell price for that currency. OK, so look at uh, what happens in the foreign currency market and, and what, what makes the price change every day or every 4.8 seconds as we saw. So we have a lot of factors that come into play, economic, economic political and market psychology. Um, let's start with market psychology because that's really a short term effect. So every day in this uh, age of the internet there's just a flood of news that comes out. Every 10 minutes we're getting a news feed from somewhere. We have a lot of speculative traders in the currency markets who watch the news all day and they have a lot of knee-jerk reactions to those market feeds. So like, oh, well, Germany looks like they're, they might raise their interest rates or now there's something very negative happening in the Russian economy and oh, here's something that happened in Latin America. So every piece of news could cause a reaction, could cause them to buy or sell that currency. So you have a lot of, of uh, blips in the market if there is, it's a bit, particularly if it's a heavy news day, a lot of announcements coming from central banks, we'll see a lot of, of uh, flux in those prices moving up and down. It's typically more of a short-term effect. Um, a longer-term effect would be political or, or economic. Is the country in turmoil? Are they changing up regimes? Um, what's happening there? Is it a stable economy? Are they raising or lowering interest rates? What does their trade balance look like? Are they uh, a net importer, a net exporter? What's ultimately driving that economy? That's going to be a longer term effect that will change uh, currency prices. So when sometimes we look at the market and, and uh, we, we typically keep an eye on euro because just being on the East Coast, euro probably represents 55% of our business. Um, so we'll see euro prices just spike in the middle of the day and uh, we're thinking, what happened here? We have no idea what's causing this and we start digging through all of our news feeds and find out that some announcement came out uh, from European Central Bank. Or sometimes uh, it's hard to tell what's, what's causing it. The, the market can be very fickle. Um, it, it can be very risky and uh, we try to protect our customers from that risk. We try to advise them on what's happening in the market. If they're making an, ex an import or an export in that currency, that can become uh, very vital to them. If, if the currency moves significantly, that could be a huge loss to them. Um, could be a gain to them as well, but they need to know that, that it's moving constantly and that price for their goods, whether it's an import or export, could always be changing. Okay, so, so some of the things that we look at, at at what's driving the price, or we don't try to forecast because it's very, very difficult to forecast the market as it's so unpredictable, but we want to look at some of the key drivers that are happening. So what, what does the foreign investment in U.S. dollar assets look like? And that's kind of a monthly number that comes out to the market shows us um, are foreigners more interested in buying U.S. equities and, and is that going to help the price of dollar compared to those currencies? Um, what does the U.S. debt level look like? We have tr obviously tremendous debt with China right now. 
that's keeping our currency weaker in the world. So how long is that going to continue? How does the market perceive that debt level? Um, we have a very low interest rate environment, which is, keep, again, keeping dollar weak. Interest rates are, are really a key um, predictor of exchange rates. Every time a, a country talks about raising their interest rates, we typically see some appreciation in the currency. Conversely, if they cut, we'll see some, some losses in that currency. Um, and what's happening in the European Union, which uh, is a hu huge, huge player in, in international trade. They've obviously had a, had a lot of difficulties with uh, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain. Just uh, how, how are they going to support that? Is Germany going to have to bail them out? What will happen to the euro? A lot of questions out there. Again, and also in China, China is uh, going like a freight train. Their, their uh, rates of growth are far larger than, than the rest of uh, the industrialized world. But when it, how long is that going to continue? Is there a bubble building there? What will happen to Chinese yuan prices? So a lot of questions that we're, we're always looking at and trying to track what's happening as far as these key indicators. So when we're looking at trends, oh, this slide is uh, a little bit tough to see, um, but we're looking at volatility. So we, at the end of the year, we always want to take a snapshot of the prices, and uh, I need to update this slide. <laughs> but it, we look at what was the average volatility on the year-on-year -year change. So if we can see that it's typically staying under 15%, so the, I know that last column is hard to see, but it's the average year-on-year -year volatility. We can see in all of these major currencies, the average, looking over five years, stays under 15%. So that's a good indicator to us, so like, okay, the world currencies are, they might be fluctuating heavily within the, the year, and we might have days and weeks of very heavy trading, but if you, we look at the big picture, typically within a 15% change on year on year. So that's a, that's a key indicator for us. We, we will really use that 15% then as kind of our line in the sand of how much, how much volatility do we need to be aware of as a bank as we're buying and selling currency in the market. We need to look at that 15% as the top level of, of our risk in looking at currency prices that are changing. This is our method for forecasting exchange rates. <laughs> so I get, we get a lot of calls from customers who say, oh, I have to pay uh, a huge euro invoice uh, in April, and I just don't know where euro is trading. Can you tell me where it's going to trade in April? Well, <laughs> we would have to get out our friendly dartboard because we, we would not be able to make a prediction like that. We, we educate our clients as much as we can by talking about all the, those factors that I just mentioned, explain to them how it works, but we obviously cannot uh, come up with a prediction. And neither can anyone else, because I, I see all of the analysis coming in from the large banks out of New York who have a, a whole bank of uh, PhD economists who are running analysis and trying to forecast. And they will have vastly different forecasts, vastly different. And so it's, you don't know what the right answer is. The market can be very unpredictable. OK, but one thing we have seen um, as far as US dollar is that we, we started seeing devaluation back in 2001. And that's uh, now 12 years ago. Um, but. But the U.S. dollar started to sink then. Through the 90s, the, the dollar was fairly strong. So what does that mean for the U.S.? Well, that, that gives us a lot of good export opportunities. So if the dollar is weaker, that means our products look cheaper overseas. So, so right now we have a lot of strong currencies out there. Japanese yen, very strong. So that means uh, Japanese buyers can buy U.S. goods for very cheaply. Um, Euro is still somewhat strong. It's come down from some of the higher levels where it was trading a couple of years ago, but still fairly strong currency. We see Canadian dollar stronger. Canadian dollar is uh, now stronger than the U.S. dollar, where for many years Canadian was, Canada was kind of viewed as, as the cheap place to go and, and buy stuff. And now Canadian dollar is, is stronger than the U.S. dollar. So, so it does make our goods more, more uh, competitive, cheaper to foreign buyers. Um, we find foreign customers are, are seeking out U.S. manufacturers. So as again, again, as I mentioned before, a lot of our customers who never anticipated 
becoming exporters suddenly are contacted from foreign companies saying, hey, I, I'm interested in your product. Could you send me a sample or could I talk to you about that? So, so uh, we do see a lot of new activity coming out of that. And again, the state and federal export assistance government is very focused on increasing exports. The U.S. is still very much of a net importer. We still have that huge trade deficit, um, primarily driven by China. Um, and again, that goes back to currency. So, so why is China such a big exporter? Because they have a dirty float on the currency. So their currency is priced artificially low, which makes their products look very cheap to everyone. Every time you shop at Walmart, you're taking advantage of the dirty float on the Chinese yuan. So, so how do we fight against that? As, as a, a country that has a currency on a clean float, how do we fight against that, that artificial control of their currency? And that's what causes a lot of uh, controversy with the, the U.S. and the Chinese government. Okay, so how does the U.S. trade deficit affect the dollar? Um, obviously, again, we're, we're a net importer, so the net at outflow of our currency is going out of the country. So we're paying all those foreign suppliers, making our currency flow out. Um, and then other, other uh, companies on, on the export side are taking that U.S. dollar and selling it. They're going to be buying back into their own currency. And as your, your supply of your country's currency increases, it will depreciate. Okay, so that you have more out there floating, so the, the value is going to go down. Okay, here's just a snapshot. Um, just to see what, what does the rest of the world look like as far as interest rates. And I think Australia is actually um, at 3.5 right now. But you can see that the trend typically remains the same. Um, Switzerland and Japan are typically always the lowest interest rate with the U.S. coming in next. And then Australia and New Zealand typically the highest interest rate. So we see a lot of currency transactions happening by speculators where they're buying into Australian dollar and holding it because of the, the higher interest rates. Okay, so we talked about all the risks in foreign currency and how the market can, can change unexpectedly and affect our customers. So how, how are we going to help them with those risks? So first, we want to introduce them to the different types of risk. And uh, we have transaction risk, which is the actual payable or receivable. So if a company is paying or receiving in a foreign currency, they have a risk on when, I, when, when am I going to get paid or when am I going to make that payment? Where is that currency going to be trading? So that's going to change up that US dollar cost or that US dollar receivable for them. Translation risk is a longer term risk. So for example, if a US company has a foreign subsidiary, Let's say they have a, a subsidiary in Switzerland. So that subsidiary is now producing Swiss franc financial statements. Um, and they're running their business in Swiss franc. But at the end of the year, they're going to take that Swiss franc income statement, balance sheet, everything, and they're going to convert it back to dollars to be pulled into the parent company's financial statement. So where is Swiss francs trading on the last day of the year when that happens? And uh, if Swiss franc suddenly drops, is it going to make the company look less profitable? If it goes up, is it going to make it look more profitable than it really was? So you have some translation risk there. Economic risk is the, the risk that businesses face in, in global markets. So for example, if I'm a US company and I'm selling my product in US dollars in Europe, how does that price look in comparison to local competitors within the European Union who are selling their product in Euro? So how, how does that mix uh, happen throughout the world, you know, whether it's Canada, Europe, Australia, Japan, wherever, if you're selling in one currency and your competitor is selling in another, how does that look to the market who's buying your product? Okay, so we want to help our customers put together a risk aversion strategy. So typically we would go out to our client and we would want to meet with the controller or the CFO or the head accounting manager, whoever that might be, and we'd, we'd want to talk to them about defining the currency risk. So we have a lot of customers who have suppliers in Europe, and they typically buy the goods on a regular basis. So every month they might be paying a half a million euro 
to their European supplier to bring in this steady flow of goods to support their business. So if they are paying a half a million euro every month to this supplier and euro is steadily appreciating throughout the year, at the end of the year their profit margin on that, on that product could be very, very tight because every time they buy it, it's more expensive for them. Even though that company has not raised their prices, the supplier could say, the price is the same, one widget is 62 euro. And they may keep that 62 euro in place, but if the currency market changes, it's not, it's not the same dollar price to our customer. So we, 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 we want that CFO or that controller to create a worst case scenario. What if euro appreciates 15% this year? What's that going to do to your profit margin? Are you still going to be able to run this business uh, without showing a loss? So we want them to think through that process. We want to see them build a worst case scenario. And then we want them to come up with a strategy. Are they always going to pay in euro? Are they always going to buy in the spot market? Or are they going to buy in the forward market, which is a hedge? We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, so we, we want them to understand the risk and to have a strategy to, to manage that risk. So again, you, you have the, your total currency risk in the middle there, and then you have uh, the different types of risk that will be affecting you, the transaction, the translation, the economic, and then the forecasted. You could, they could say, well, euro is only forecasted to rise maybe 5% this year. Well. We know, we know what happens to forecasts, they're, they're often not right. So we need to be aware of, of every type of risk that could be affecting us. So here's a very simple example um, of a Japanese yen. And, and yen uh, was a currency that uh, in the past year went to like a 40 year high. Just uh, crazy prices on yen. It's very expensive currency. So this is a very legitimate example. American company importing TV screens. So uh, if, if the price is 800,000 yen on a 90 day payment term, so on July 11th you would have your purchase order. So you put the purchase order out to buy your TV screens and you're actually going to make your payment. Your payable's happening on October 11th. So now, in between that time, yen has appreciated by two cents. So you can see the, the number's going down because, again, yen is a divide currency. So we need to divide that exchange rate. So the lower the number, the more expensive the currency. So now, um, for one TV screen, they're paying $263 more. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but what if you're buying 100 of those? That's, that's a lot of money. And if that happens every month, that can be devastating to a company. And, and we've seen our clients be devastated by currency moves. We've seen them benefit from currency moves. But the important factor for them to remember is that there is a risk there. OK, so we, how we help them is that we're going to offer them a hedge. We're going to sell them a hedge, which is typically in the form of a forward contract. Um, a lot of times when we talk about hedges to companies, they get nervous. They say, oh, well, I don't, I don't want to hedge because we're very conservative and we don't speculate here. So they have a, a misconception of hedging. Hedging is actually the opposite of speculation. And when you put a hedge in and you, you actually buy a forward contract, and a forward contract is when you're going to lock in the currency price ahead of time. Um, you're reducing the risk. You're completely eliminating the risk because you know exactly the price that you're going to pay. So we can stand here today and say, OK, euro at this moment is trading, trading at 133.50. But if you want to buy euro in June, it's trading at 135, 133.60 or whatever the price might be. We're going to quote them that forward market price. It's going to lock it in. That means in June, they have to pay for that currency. And until June, it, that, that contract will just sit. It'll sit on our books that they're buying a contract for Euro, from us. And in June, they're going to cash settle that with US dollars with us. And we're going to give them the Euro to make the payment. OK, so this is how, how companies are going to reduce the risk of currency. They're going to buy all the hedges ahead of time to support their future payables or receivables if they're an exporter. If they're receiving euro or receiving Canadian dollar, whatever the currency is, they can sell that to us in advance by booking a forward contract. So <clears throat> I won't go through this whole list. There are 
a number of different ways to slice and dice hedges in the market and some of them can be very complex. In our world, we typically sell a forward contract, which is a very simple transaction. Um, it gives, we, have a, we can see the forward prices in the market. We put a hedge in ourselves and we sell that hedge again to the company um, to either pay or receive that currency. So we, at Fulton Bank, we typically sell them out one year in advance, but you can, you can sell out two, three years in advance where you can lock that price in. So what happens after the price is locked? Say, say our friendly importer needs a half million euro in June and they lock that price with us today. So in, Mar in March, the euro market starts falling and now they've bought that euro hedge at 133.60 or whatever the price was and suddenly euro falls back. We get to June and euro's trading at 129. Well, they may look at that as losing out but really, all they did was lock in that price. They expected Euro to be at that price, and they, they locked it in, and they're going to pay for it at, at 133.60. So conversely, if the market appreciated and it went to 140, they're buying it at 133.60. So the purpose of the hedge is not to beat the market. It's not to speculate against the market. It's to freeze that US dollar payable or receivable so that they know exactly what's coming. They can forecast out their income statement ahead of time, and they're not sitting on a risky transaction. OK, so you can, you can apply a forward contract uh, to a letter of credit. So you have two, two uh, international banking transactions happening at the same time there. And here's just a quick example. Um, 100,000 euro letter of credit issued to cover a shipment of espresso makers from Italy. So our customer is the importer in this case and they're bringing in all their espresso makers. Um, the, the payment terms are 90 days after the, the bill of lading date or the shipment date and the estimated date of shipment is in March. So that means in June they would need to pay that out. So they would book a forward contract, a three month forward contract to be able to pay that. And you can book forward contract with a, a range of dates. It doesn't have to be one date. They could just say, I want to pay sometime in June. So their contract would be available anytime between June 1st and June 30th. But the point is they're locking that price in ahead of time and they're taking out the risk in the market. Okay, so why, again, why, why would you pay in a foreign currency? if you perceive that as you know more mess to deal with more transactions happening because if you're paying in the foreign currency you're paying the true price of the product so if our if our customer has a supplier in Europe who who gives them a US dollar price on the product there's an exchange rate in there somewhere because it's a, it's a European company it operates in euros but they're coming up with a dollar price so how are they coming up with that dollar price are they looking at Bloomberg Wall Street Journal, are they just picking a rate out of thin air or are they taking a rate and adding 10% to it? You know, you, you don't know what's happening behind that. So it's always good to see what the true price of the product is to make sure that there's no margin in there that that supplier has added. Um, so it, it, it now forces our customer though to take, take responsibility for that hedge. But if they know what it is in advance, they can put the hedge on and they can reduce the risk in that fluctuation. The disadvantage would be the unavailability of funds. Again, if you're importing something from like Argentina, where you have a market that's restricted, that's on a dirty float, um, can be very difficult to manage a hedge in those, in those countries. Okay, so why receive in a foreign currency? Let's just flip that conversation. Now you're an exporter. You're selling your product to Canada. You're selling your product to Australia, to Japan. Why, why would you try to build the customer in, in the local currency and not in US dollars? Because you want to be customer friendly. So now you're just going to turn that conversation around and you're, you'll say, don't worry about the currency risk. I'll take care of that. I'm going to sell you my product in your currency. So it's more, it becomes more of a marketing tool. It allows customers to, to really reach their whole customer base and, and offer that, that price in, in that customer's currency. So again, the disadvantage, if you're on the selling side, now you have to come up with that exchange rate. How are you going to set that, the exchange rate for that invoice when you're giving them an invoice in the local currency? 
I know I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay, so so again, in, in international trade, um, you know, in, in conclusion, what we tell our customers over and over is, please be pre proactive and not reactive. Don't sit on a foreign currency invoice for months and not tell us about it and then suddenly say, oops, <laughs> the currency just appreciated 10% and I'm losing money on this deal. Um, always be aware of what's happening in the market and use all the tools available to you. And just always be prepared for markets to turn because the currency market can be very, very volatile and, and surprises even me who, who has been watching it for many years. Okay. I know we're right at noon, but uh, if anybody has a quick question, I'd be happy to take it. Yes? I'm kind of interested because there's a lot of international cultures that really don't like formal <coughs> agreements and such and documents. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of wondering if, if in your experiences you come across uh, cultures that don't like um, letters of uh, credit. Um, Yes, we do, we do see that at times uh, where they, they're, they want to do everything more on a handshake. Um, and it's, at that point, it's up to our customer to push that conversation. If our customer isn't comfortable with the handshake agreement, then they really have to insist, well, we want to make this transaction with you. We want to sell you the goods or we want to import your goods. But, but we can only do it under the terms of the letter of credit. And we can try to help them to simplify the letter of credit so it doesn't have a lot of complex language in it. Um, but, but it's really up to our customer to, detri to drive that so that they're not at risk. Anything else? OK. Well, thank you for your attention. I hope it was helpful. <laughs>